Folks, welcome. Uh, <laughs> we'll try that again. Three, two. Folks, welcome to another episode of There's Just Something About Kansas City, where we take a really positive look and a really casual conversation about the people, places, and things that make this such a great place to live. And I can't, I couldn't have a better guy in here. I almost wore a tuxedo. Today, that's okay. Because <laughs> I've got Bob Kendrick in here from the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. And you know how Bob dresses normally. But Bob, today, I got him coming off the golf course. And it just worked out for him. You have no idea how close I came to wearing a tux. Oh, that would have that. been hilarious. That would have been funny. Oh, yeah. it really would have. Well, how are you, my friend? Man, I'm doing great. Frank, I'm doing great. It's so good to see you. And thanks so much for making time to have me. Oh, my on gosh. The show. Thanks for coming in. I mean, it's, it's just going to be awesome. And you're no stranger to podcasts, okay? <laughs> I am a stranger. I was dragged kicking and screaming into this thing, okay? But. My wife finally, it was been her idea for like three or four years ago. She just kept hearing from everybody. She'd talk to them about where they were from and what they were doing. And, you know, why are you here? And everybody just had stopped for one second and just say, you know, there's just something about Kansas City. And, uh, you know, I, I think you know that uh, as, as well as I do about this great city that we live in. I know we got problems, okay? Well, every does, city does, though. But we've got, we're, we're focusing on the positive here, and I think that's a, a, a really important thing. But talk about the other podcast. You're doing your podcast. So. The same thing. I came in kicking and screaming. <laughs> uh, you, because people had been saying the exact same thing. said, Bob, you really need to do a podcast. And I'm saying to myself, I don't have time to do a podcast. And my friends over at Sirius XM Radio was one of those that kept saying, you need to do a podcast. And they stayed after me. And in 2021, as we were still kind of embroiled in the pandemic. Yeah, the COVID thing. The COVID yeah. thing. It and freed up some time. It, it freed up a little bit of time. Uh -huh. And we launched a podcast, a national podcast called Black Diamonds, Untold Stories of the Negro Leagues. And Frank, this thing has gone bananas. Uh, we're very blessed, very fortunate. It was named the National Sport Podcast of the Year by Ad Week, its first year in production. And we just tell stories. And for me, I kind of flip roles. I go from being a storyteller to then trying to do what you've done for your entire career, interview folks yeah. around subject matter that we're talking about relative to the Negro Leagues. And we have built a legion of fans who are now falling in love with the Negro Leagues. Many of these are the same stories that our friend Buck O'Neill shared for years prior to his passing. But you think about this. Buck has been gone now for almost 17 years. So there's a, an entire generation of baseball fans who have not heard these stories. Right, and players. And players. Mm -hmm. And so I get to share these stories. We find guests that relate back to these stories, and we just have a discussion, and the program has provided a tremendous platform, national and international, for the museum, and we're seeing the ripple effect of it. You know, we're seeing... Our individual level of giving has grown considerably. We're seeing people who are now making plans to visit Kansas City because they've been listening to the podcast. And, of course, as we talked about during the midst of the pandemic, it gave people something to look forward to. You know, we release these every Thursday. My commitment to series is 20 episodes. I think each year we've done probably in the neighborhood of 26 to 30 episodes. <laughs> they set me up with a little pseudo studio in my office, right. and we record and we roll, and it's, but it's been great. Yeah, and the thing about it is, too, and we'll relate back to Buck O'Neill, you were a volunteer for a long time at the Negro Lakes Baseball Museum, uh, probably 10 years, right? Before you, before you then started, I started, to, uh, I started volunteering for the museum. It's hard to believe that it's been thirty years ago. Wow, nineteen ninety three. Wow, I walked into a one room office about as big as this studio where we're recording, and I'll never forget this as long as my mother would say I'm in my natural mind. <laughs> I'm working for the Kansas City Star at that time. And so I was senior copywriter, Frank, in the Star's promotions department, right. which functioned as an in-house advertising agency. So I had drawn the assignment of promoting the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum's first ever traveling exhibition, an exhibition called Discover Greatness. It is still touring the country to this day, 30 wow. years later. And honestly, I didn't even know that there was a Negro Leagues Museum, and it was literally just right down the street from the Kansas City Star at that time. So I said, well, I better go down, 
visit this museum, try to get a little bit of research done so I can put this campaign together. I pull up in front of the Lincoln Building, and I go up to the third floor of the Lincoln Building, and I'm still not sure I'm in the right place. And I remember knocking on the door of this office space and the late Don Motley. Oh, I remember Don. Don sure, Motley, huh, who was the executive yeah. director at that time. He was sitting in the office, and I kind of sheepishly peeked my head in. I said, well, I'm looking for the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. And he looks up at me, and he smiles. He says, son, you're standing in it. <laughs> but, Frank, as I tell people all the time, little did I know that I had literally just walked into what would become my passion. I fell in love with the museum, and I fell in love with the extraordinary athletes who made this story. And here I was, certainly considered myself, to be a baseball fan, and I quickly realized I didn't know a doggone thing about this game as it relates to the history of this game and this country. And I guess you could say I became enamored with it. I wanted to learn as much as I could, and I didn't want to keep it to myself. I had no idea, man that it was going to turn into a career, and perhaps one of the most gratifying things that I could have done either personally or professionally. And here I am now uh, for the last 12 years mm -hmm. serving as president. So you go from being a volunteer to trying Not to Not being lead. able to find the office. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> to now trying to lead one of the most important cultural institutions in the world, that being the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. Yeah, and it is right here in Kansas City, which yeah. is just just makes it e even more special. And, as, and of course, you, you always talk about, and I think it's your quote, you were bitten by the buck bug, which <laughs> a lot of people ended up being bitten by, okay? We're talking about the late, great Buck O'Neill. Yeah. And you remind me so much of him from this standpoint is you know the history, you know the stories, you tell the stories, and people, when once they walk in, I've seen so many Major League Baseball players come back out and you follow them on Twitter or whatever, and they'll, they'll go through the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum and they'll just go, I had no idea, idea yeah, that, yeah. that these men yeah. and you couldn't even play in the Major Leagues until Jackie Robinson came along. And they had their own league from the 1900s, from way back. And I'll tell you some stories about Pittsburgh, where I'm from. You know about the Crawfords oh, and the, the uh, in the home oh, state Grays. Yeah, and, and uh, they were one of the first. Pro that's one of the first professional games I, I ever saw. My dad took me to down at Greenlee Field, and, wow. in Pittsburgh. And that's well, that's how old I am. Okay, Bob. But the uh, <laughs> but the deal is, you were bitten by the buck bug in so many great stories. And just the idea that you always said, hey, when I was there, I had my, I had my mouth shut and my ears open. Well, and that's what you did. And, and, and I was smart enough to do that because, as you know, and you knew Buck well. Oh, yeah. You spent a lot of time with Buck. There was infinite wisdom that he would share. He didn't force it on you. It was there if you wanted it. And, and, I, and I was smart enough to keep my mouth closed and I listened. And now I get to share those stories. The same stories that he shared with me. And, and, Frank, every time I tell one of those stories, I feel like I'm keeping him alive in my mind and in my heart. And to see people respond to these stories in a similar fashion. No one could ever tell them the way <laughs> Buck O'Neill, he, he could spin a yarn oh with the very God. best you of bet. them. You'd be there for an hour and you think you're there for five <laughs> minutes. You know? But it just, it just fills my heart with joy and to see particularly young athletes when we walk through the museum, this never gets old. It never gets old. I love sharing the stories. I love seeing their reactions to mm -hmm. the story. And I think it just builds a greater bond, particularly between those young major leaguers, and I don't care what color your skin might be. This is all about love of the game. That's what the story of the Negro Leagues is at its crux, is about love of the game. And they all relate to that love of the game. And I think also you see so many people now from other parts of the country since the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. And ever since Ken Burns Baseball, okay, where Buck was the star and everybody in the world all of a sudden learned who Buck O'Neill was at that time. And it was such a great <laughs> uh, historical look at Major League Baseball, all of Major League Baseball, which has never been examined in in one entity before, you know, and I think that was that was really important through that time. But he was he was such oh. a star oh. at that point. He was magnificent. Yeah, and, and the project baseball was epic. 
But the inning that Ken dedicated to the Negro Leagues, mm-hmm. Shadow Ball, yep. introduced the world to Buck O'Neill. And as I would describe, introduced this very charming, gentle man who was telling these wonderful stories to baseball fans that they had not heard before, and he was doing it with a twinkle in his eye and a (laughs) smile that lit up the screen, and everybody fell in love with Buck. He was 82 years old at that time, and and I'll never forget after his first appearance in the documentary after it aired, the headline in the Kansas City Star said, a star is born at 82. <laughs> oh, he loved that, too. You know he loved it. He, he loved he loved the spotlight a little bit, too, which oh, was no, great. No. And, and, you he, know. And, and the good yeah. Lord blessed him yes. to live another 12 years mm. after that, where in many ways, Frank Buck had been one of the Negro League's biggest stars. But it didn't even come close to what happened to him after his appearances in Ken, Ken's documentary. Right. Yeah, he became an even bigger star. And like I said, the good Lord blessed him to live another 12 years where he was literally gallivanting across this country, preaching the gospel of the Negro Leagues and the virtues of his museum to any and everybody who would listen. And I guess I was hanging from the hem of his garment. (laughs) And and now I became a (laughs) disciple of Buck O'Neill. And so I get to preach the gospel uh, and the virtues of Buck's museum. Yeah, and it, and, and it continues on to this day. And I, I think how many uh, people who visit the museum nowadays, like during the summer, how many of those are out of towners and how many of those are Kansas City, you know, well, in surrounding area? Yeah, yeah. Well, you visitors. know, we're still working hard to try to get more local folks to come. But, you know, it's almost we don't like do that. Right. You, yeah. you, you can't see the forest for the trees. It's right there. <laughs> it's right there. It's right there. But it's rare that we become tourists in our own city. Exactly. Now, we will go somewhere else and take on that exact same experience in another city, but we don't oftentimes do it at home. More times than not, I've got people coming to Kansas City to visit relatives who will say, will you take me to see the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum? Right. And that's what drives them there, or there's some major happening in town, and of course, then we're filled with civic pride mm-hmm. because we know we want the world to know we've got the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum, and we get them during the summer months. Most of these folks who are coming are from outside the metropolitan area for sure, and they're they're planning trips to come and see. That's how special this place is. I oftentimes call it Kansas City's gift to the rest of the world, mm-hmm. but we want more people at home to embrace what we're doing to come in and experience what the rest of the world is so excited about. It is special that the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum is in Kansas City. There are a lot of cities. And you just mentioned one, Pittsburgh, whose black baseball history is as rich as any city, who would love to have the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum, but it is right here where it is supposed to be, Kansas City. But we do need more local folks to come in and experience what this is all about. And thankfully... What the Kansas City Royals have done over the last two years Mm -hmm. by making the museum free during the month of February, we've seen more local people than ever take advantage of that opportunity, and they're finally coming through those doors to experience it. And you know what happens then? They come back. Yeah, they do. Or they bring, then they will bring Uh relatives back or Uh anybody else that visits. Besides going to some of the other major attractions in Kansas City as well, you know? Yeah. And especially baseball fans. Oh, yeah. Because they want to know the history, and especially ever since Buck did. And Ken Burns did baseball. Yeah. I mean, it just became, oh, that's there. I didn't know that. Was there ever a point where it uh, somebody else wanted it bad enough that they tried to grab it and take it away? Well, there had been a number of cities that wanted to do it. And, and even before we came about, there was a failed Negro Leagues Baseball Museum in all places, Ashland, Kentucky. Hmm. I have no idea why they thought a Negro Leagues Museum would work in Ashland <laughs> other than the fact that there was this oil company there that had put together a reunion of Negro League players on multiple occasions, but a museum of that nature just simply did not work. It folded, and a lot of the stuff that they had went over to Cooperstown. Oh, yeah. And then years later, we came along and created the Negro League's Baseball Museum in Kansas City. There is a Negro Southern League Museum in Birmingham, 
But we're starting to now explore the possibilities of creating satellite museums, exhibition in other cities that had substantial Negro Leagues yeah. history. Pittsburgh's black baseball history should be told. Mm -hmm. New York, Cleveland. These are great areas that black baseball was so prominent. And so my long-term vision is to create what I would call, Frank, a Smithsonian affiliate kind of relationship where we create these satellite exhibitions with all roads leading back to the National Museum, the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. And so that's kind of how we're looking into the future because we will never have enough space to tell every one of those <laughs> cities' stories, and their stories deserve to be told. Yeah, and I was going to say, you probably have um, a lot of artifacts and a lot of historical stuff stashed somewhere either in a museum or in warehouses somewhere or whatever that could be end up going somewhere else and being put out on display yeah. in those cities. And those cities themselves, like Pittsburgh with the, the Grays, Homestead oh. Grays and the, uh, and the Crawfords. We're talking two of the greatest teams of all time, right. two and, franchises of all time in the Grays and Crawfords. Yeah, right. And they probably have their own memorabilia maybe in some dusty old warehouse somewhere. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not getting looked at, and they don't realize what kind of a gem they might have right yeah. there. Yeah, Yeah. no, you know, there's always this constant quest to try and go out there and find this very rare treasure, this memorabilia from the Negro Leagues. And to be able, number one, with our most recent announcement, to build a brand new Negro Leagues Baseball Museum, I think this is going to be a tremendous catalyst in helping us acquire more stuff. Right. Because a lot of times people Because want, you'll have room. Yeah, we'll have more room, and people want to see it on display in this new facility. And You're going to go 10, to, it's going to be 10 times bigger, right? It's 10. From, yeah. from 3,000 to 30,000 square feet? Exactly. Yeah. And so, you know, we're excited about this expansion opportunity, but we're also excited about working with some of these other cities to be able to expand on those stories. Right. Yeah, because those cities all have tremendous... I, I saw, oftentimes wonder, had the pirates been more aggressive mm -hmm. in trying to integrate the game with all that talent that was right there in their backyard? They were right down the street. I mean, Frank, <laughs> this is Hall of Fame talent that we're talking about when you start to talk about the likes of Cool Papa Bell, Josh Gibson... Buck Leonard, uh, I mean, Ray Brown, the right. list goes on, Oscar Charleston. All these folks are playing right there in Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. The Pirates, we'd be talking about the Pirates like folks talk about the Yankees. Yeah, we, we'd be talking about, well, let's go visit Pittsburgh when we go see the <laughs> Negro Leagues baseball museum. Right? But, they, but they, they, did not, they did not grab it. And they were, they were in, the, the Negro Leagues there was in business from 1900 all the way to 1950. And... The um, I think it was it was the Crawfords I believe their two fields one was Forbes Field where they the played Pirates played where when, the Pirates played right where the Pirates played in, in that time before they built Three Rivers downtown exactly it was right off the Pitt campus there yes even the Steelers played there for, exactly. for a period of time and then the the other field was Greenlee. Greenlee Field but the interesting thing about Greenlee black built and black, black owned. owned first one ever. In, in the country, there's black Gus built Greenlee, black owned. Gus Greenlee, who owned the Pittsburgh Crawfords, paid $100,000 wow. in 1931 <laughs> to build his own ballpark, Greenlee Field. $100,000 is pretty good money now. That's like a billion dollars. But $100,000 in 1931? Yeah, that's what I meant. I don't know what the economic index says, but I know it was worth several million dollars at least. And he built his own ballpark. Uh huh. And, and he built a juggernaut in the Pittsburgh Crawfords who came in to rival the Homestead Grays. And Cumberland Posey owned the Homestead Grays. Cumberland Posey is that rare figure that is in both the baseball and basketball halls of fame. Outstanding basketball player. And Cum Posey's family came from great means. So he had some influence. And so he was always able to go buy great talent for his homestead sure. grades. Well, here comes Gus Greenlee with that same kind of financial wherewithal. 
and literally create a civil war of black baseball there in Pittsburgh. So Gus Greenlee did to come Posey what Cumberland Posey had done to the other people and started to rob him of his star players by outbidding him and, and built this dynamic team called the Pittsburgh Crawfords. Yeah, and the Crawfords actually put the Grays out of business. <laughs> they, put them out. <laughs> they took all their great players and put them right out of business. I tell you, it's one of the first, we had Greenlee Fields, one of the first professional games I'd seen. I think I'd seen a Pirate game or two before that. And then my dad said, you've got to go. we got to go see these guys play. And I said, who are these guys? He said, come on, we're going. And we went. And it was my first exposure to African Americans. I mean, yes. I'm living in a neighborhood where I am in Homewood, which is a, a, a black area of Pittsburgh, was was right down the street. But we were in Point Breeze. We were across the, the, the street. Okay, nobody went down there. And nobody came up to our area. And it was pretty segregated at that time. Yeah. And, um, and the whole thing, the dad said, we're going. My dad, you know, I dressed up in my Sunday clothes. My dad <laughs> dressed up in his suit. And I went, Dad, we're, we're going to church? <laughs> uh, well, in some ways, son, some we are ways going. It is. We are exactly. going to church, yeah. And, and that was one of the first professional games I'd ever seen. So it was just, it was crazy for me to be able to see that. Well, you know, I hear these stories of the hill. Everybody talks district. about the Hill, yeah. district Hill District and the Crawford Grill that was also owned by Greenlee and all mm-hmm. the legendary jazz stars and they everybody that the, came through there. The hurricane? Oh, absolutely. It was up there, oh, yeah. It was jumping on the hill like it was jumping here in Kansas City at 18th and Vine where the museum is located today. That, that's right. The hill was just overlooked downtown Pittsburgh. And then they, they did the gentrification of the hill because they knocked <laughs> it. They knocked down everybody's residences. Yep. To build the Civic Arena where the Penguins play. Yep. And uh, now where they built the, the new arenas there as well. They're, exactly. They're still almost on the same spot. Yep. So, yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, it's crazy. And how our histories is, have almost, intersected they, here a little they, bit. They, they intertwine because it's the same story when we talk about urban communities. Pretty much the same story throughout this country. Right. And uh, it's really interesting when we examine the story of the Negro Leagues across all spectrums. Because, obviously, the Negro Leagues helped change the game. Mm -hmm. It is the place that these players, Jackie Robinson, comes out of the Negro Leagues to go integrate Major League Baseball. And so it creates this bridge for black and brown players to move into Major League Baseball. That movement, of course, spelled the demise of the Negro Leagues. Exactly. And with this demise you saw the demise of so many urban communities because the Negro Leagues had been such a catalyst in those cities. So right. wherever you had successful black baseball, you typically had thriving black economies. And so it was this kind of bittersweet aspect to this story. It was good morally and socially. It was devastating economically. Yeah, that you know that's really interesting because, yeah, you're right. I didn't think about that as yeah. much, you know. Uh, finally, they, you know, the... Negro League players finally get a chance to show what they can do against the so-called better league. The be- exactly. Okay, and all of a sudden, the better league guys are looking and go, I better go find something else to do. <laughs> I'm not going to beat that guy. I, that's for sure, you know. So, I, you know, I think in Cleveland was the same way because, um, doggone, the um, – the second uh, player, Larry Doby. Larry Doby w- was with the Cleveland Indians, and yes. he he was the second the second player. Th- that's the trivia question. Okay, we know Jack Robinson is number one. Who's number two? And it was Larry uh, Doby. Cleveland. And it's funny that you mentioned that because in, in my podcast, I draw the parallel that Jackie Robinson's breaking of the color barrier carried for black folks carried the same level of euphoria that we saw collectively as a nation with Neil Armstrong. Walked on the moon. Right. Jackie Robinson was our Neil Armstrong in many regards. Larry Doby was our Buzz Aldrin. See, Buzz walked on the moon too. Yeah, he did. And, and nobody, nobody sees remembers remember. that. <laughs> hey, Buzz, <laughs> Buzz walked just seconds after Neil Armstrong walked on the moon. That's right. And no one remembers, and that is Larry Doby. Yeah. He is our Buzz Aldrin, yeah. but he shouldn't be forgotten. And Larry, well, he's a great player. A great player, and Larry Doby went through just as much, some may argue even more, than Jackie because he's playing in the American League, right. which didn't have the urban centers that the National League did, and the national media was following Jackie. No one's paying Larry Doby any attention. Frank, Larry Doby was 23 years old 
literally thrown into a powder keg of racism mm -hmm. when he joined Cleveland in July of 1947, just weeks after Jackie had joined Brooklyn. When he walked in the clubhouse, nobody would shake his hand. When he went out on the field, no one wanted to warm up with him. Welcome to the major league. Yeah. And yet Larry Doby handled himself with the same grace, class, and dignity that we rightfully held Jackie for. But all of those integration pioneers who would subsequently break the, their respective major league teams' color barriers, it didn't get any easier for any of them. Mm -mm. I think the consensus is that once Jackie breaks the color barrier, oh, this thing is all good now. It's better now. No, it wasn't. And so we recently created an exhibition called Barrier Breakers that tells all of their stories from Jackie joining Brooklyn on April 15th, 1947, mm -hmm. through Elijah Pumsey Green being the last to complete the integration cycle 12 years later. Wow. It took 12 years. Right. It was Boston, Boston was the last, was the team last to integrate, time. 1959. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. One of the most racist cities <laughs> in the whole country, despite the fact it was in it was way above the Mason Dixon line. Way above the Mason Dixon right. line. And, above, and, you know, and ironically, I just left Boston where our barrier breaker exhibit was on display. The Red Sox were one of the teams that helped bring the exhibit to Boston. And maybe in some ways it was them acknowledging a painful history for them. Oh, sure. Because you don't like being that last team no. to do this. And the Yawkey family had always long been considered racist. And so they really didn't want a black player, but... At some point, all the other teams had a black player. I think we better get on We board. better get one, too. Yeah. And they ended up getting Pumpsy Green, having passed up Hall of Fame talent. Nothing against Mr. Green. But Boston had every opportunity to get superstar talent, Jackie Robinson, Willie Mays, and a litany of others who they had staged tryouts for, but they were basically just staging. They had no intent on signing those players. Yeah. Just uh, yeah, just trying to get on yeah, board. Sure. Boston, just to know how bad it was, they were the last city also to integrate their schools. Mm -hmm. they're, they're one of the last cities uh, to uh, to integrate their their high schools and their grade schools. Uh, and, everything and, else. And, and and you talk about field with irony. Boston had a black hockey player, Willie O'Ree, with the Boston Brewers in 1958. I remember before that before Boston had a black baseball player. Wow. Well, I take that back because the Boston Braves had Sam Jethro, and they signed Henry Aaron. But the Red Sox were kind of late in the, in, the, in, in play. Wow. You, you have such great stories. Just like Buck did, this is, uh, this is so much fun. We're going to find out a little bit more about you. Okay, <laughs> Crawfordsville, Georgia yeah. was your hometown. T tell me a little bit about growing up in Crawfordsville. Man, carefree environment. I, it was just a small rural town. Yeah, you said it's right between Augusta and Atlanta. In Atlanta, right, right mm -hmm. off of Interstate 20. Yeah, my buddies keep trying to get a sign put there now, the home of Bob Kendrick, <laughs> but nobody's paying any attention. There's still no that sign. Might, that might happen someday. <laughs> that might happen someday. And But for, it was such a carefree environment. You know, it's one of those communities where everybody knows everybody. Everyone has jurisdiction over you, mm -hmm. you know, so you weren't going to get in any trouble. Um, oddly enough, it, too, was a very segregated town, mm -hmm. though, uh, when I was a kid growing up. But as a kid, you don't really pay it any attention. I went to a public high school that was all black, even though there were white kids in my community they just didn't go to school with us, and that was just kind of how it was. So yeah. you, and, and, and sometimes when you're growing up like that, you think, well, this is every city. Yeah. You know, this is every, every yeah. place in America because yeah. there's, there's the black school and there's the white school. And that was just the way it was. And I remember vividly going through the back door of the little cafe there. You didn't really think anything about it because that's kind of the way it was. And the cook was black and she made a great hamburger. You had the little three, two, three booths they had back right. there in the, black, in the back for black folks to sit in. But you didn't really think anything about it until after I got a little older. And when I got a little older, and particularly after I left to go to college, now you kind of realize, you know, what this was really all about. Yeah. But it was just life as we knew it. And so, like I said, it was really carefree and... Man, I wouldn't change 
any of my upbringing for the world. You know now, why? My golf buddies Because laughing. look where you are. That one, <laughs> you know, you know, and, you know. and my kids always hear the stories of, of the challenges. And, you know, my, my mother and father did a great job of not letting me know we were poor. We were poor. But I really didn't know it because when everybody got the same thing that you got, everybody around you have the same thing that you have, nothing. Right. You don't know any better. And then when I got to school, I realized, oh, wait a minute. You know, kids <laughs> driving nice cars and staying in apartments and all of this. And I was like, oh, my mom and daddy kind of shielded me from this yeah. side of life. Which but was okay. It was okay because yeah. I may not have had every, not everything that I wanted. I had everything that I needed and then some. And I think it has helped me see life through a different lens that has been so tremendously beneficial you know, as I've tried to ascend in this life, right. you know, you just see things a little different. You you don't take some things for granted that others might take for granted, like indoor plumbing, for example. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to go there, but I knew you were. <laughs> that's, that's just one of those things where you go, you mean they have these indoors? Yeah, Seriously? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and you mean there's air Even conditioning? Even in the winter? Exactly. <laughs> You're absolutely right. But, but but also, you know, you coming out of an environment like that, you could have been angry. I mean, you could have all of a sudden you see all this other stuff. You could have gone, man, no. you know, I'm angry. I'm, I'm angry no. at all this. I, yeah. And you have that you have that personality, you know, that I no. don't think you're going to let anything I get had, you angry. I had two loving parents. Yeah. Who gave me all that they could give me. And even what they didn't have, particularly by way of a formal education, they always understood the value of an education. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to make sure that all of their children were educated. And they did everything they possibly could to instill in me a belief that I could be better, that I could do more if I set my mind and heart mm -hmm. to it. And, and they pushed me. They, they pushed me. And of course, in that environment, you're kind of reared to leave the nest. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that, you know, it ain't like it is now where the kids stay with you. Oh. They'll stay with you for the rest of your life if you let them. And, 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 They're and, never and, off the payroll, <laughs> my friend. Never <laughs> off the payroll. <laughs> and so now when you grow up in that environment, you either going to go to work, you're going to school, or you're going to the military, which is both work and possibly school. Yeah. But you were going to leave there. And that was their job, you know, and they kind of push you out the nest. But, you know, my parents always made me believe that I could do something special with my life. Right. And, and I, I hear my mother's voice all the time. You know, I hear her voice all the time. And, you know, I know they both would be tremendously proud. Oh, I know they would, yeah. All I hear is my mother's voice going, Francis, we <laughs> won't get down here. Okay, so my, my mind was just a little different, okay? Yeah, no, and my mother know, was the disciplinarian. Uh, I know, so family. was mine. Oh, she I didn't had, play. I had the wooden spoons cracked <laughs> over these knuckles more times. My dad came to me one time and said, you do me a favor. Can you calm down just a little? You're costing me a fortune in wooden spoons. I said, okay, Dad, I'll, I'll give it a chance. And you were an athlete. Yes. And this is where our story starts, starts to turn towards Kansas City. And you ended up at Park College on a basketball, on a basketball scholarship. basketball scholarship. Now, you're not the tallest guy in the world. No. Okay? No. You're not the biggest guy in the world. You must and, have been one hell of a point guard. Well, I'll tell you that much. And, and the thing about it, Frank, <laughs> I was playing the smallest class in Georgia, Class A. You know who was in Class A when I was there? Hmm. Herschel Walker. Oh, good Lord. Yeah, we both graduated in 1980. Did you play football? I didn't play. My school was too small to field a high school oh, football, football team. team. Okay. Didn't have a high school baseball team. So we only had basketball and track. And so anyone who knows me knows that I do not believe in running <laughs> if there's not a ball involved. <laughs> no, you don't run just for the sake of running. No, that's crazy. You don't want to run 26 no. miles? Come so, on. Wow. So I, played, I played basketball, and all my other brothers played basketball. Now, in the summer, on the weekends, they played hardball. I would always watch them. They didn't call it baseball. They called it hardball. Uh -huh. And they'd go to the park, and people would come around and park the cars and sit on the cars and watch my town play the neighboring town. And I always, you know, enjoyed baseball. But my, my town was too small to have a baseball team and, and way too small to have a football team. And But uh, Herschel Walker was there in Riceville, Georgia at that time. And a lot of people didn't think that – 
his skill set was going to transition over to Georgia because he was one of the biggest guys. You know, he was running against guys. Yeah, he, he was 220, 225 pounds in high school. And Everybody I'm not was sure overmatched when exactly, they faced him. Yeah. Exactly. And, but he was a special kind of athlete, and it absolutely transitioned. Vince Dooley is the only guy that could, could hold Herschel back. Uh, and Vince finally realized, uh-uh, I got to let this thoroughbred and turn him loose. Let him go. And, and he did. But So I played basketball. I was going to Howard University. Mm -hmm. And I had been going to Howard University since I was maybe 12, 13 years old. I had a brother that lived in D.C. Yeah. I would go see him every summer. And that is where I was going. I had gotten accepted to Howard University my senior year. They wanted me to walk on for basketball. They didn't have any money for me. And so I was prepared to do that. And at the 13th hour, I get a letter from Hal Shaver over at Park College. He had become the brand-new basketball coach at Park College. And he says, we got a little money for you if you want to come here and play basketball and be a student athlete here at Park College. I had never heard of Park College or Parkville, Missouri. Or Kansas City, for that <laughs> matter, for a private person. Hold it. Where's my map? We got, wait, a wait a minute. There's two Kansas Cities here. Which one, which one is it? <laughs> and I said, well, I'm going with the money. Yeah, I'm going with the money. And I left Crawfordville, Georgia, the late summer of 1980. My brother from D.C. came to get me. We loaded up the car, and we drove to Parkville, Missouri, and, uh, you know, when you read the brochures, because I didn't go for a visit, never went for a visit. Right. But the brochures made it seem like Kansas City was real close. Uh -huh. You know, it ain't real close. Yeah, it, no. It's close you can if see you got it from a car. There. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I can't walk there. <laughs> and, and the old ASB bridge. Oh, yes, oh, absolutely. That was the scariest thing I ever seen in my life <laughs> going across that bridge. And we go over, and we finally get on the campus, and the dormitory that I was staying in, it, it kind of resembled Wrigley Field with the ivy running up the building. It looked old and looked a little dilapidated. And my brother looked at me and said, well, are you going to stay? I said, yeah, man, I'm going to stay. And I haven't looked back since. That's because you made a commitment. Yeah. 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 You, you made a commitment yeah. and you, you went and you stayed. <laughs> so how, how was it at Park? How, how'd you do? How was the team? How'd well, you do? I was on the team. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was on the team. I, you know, playing competitively in college, and I don't care what level it is, you know, you got to bring it. Because mm -hmm. everybody who comes in, they were pretty good where they came They from. were a star. Yeah, they mm -hmm. were. And uh, I think coming out of that small school environment, it took me a little while to adjust to that. And then by my junior year, I broke my foot at the beginning of my junior year. Really, I didn't realize I had broken my foot. I actually thought I had just sprained my ankle. I went up to shoot a shot. You know, someone stepped underneath mm -hmm. me. I landed on the foot, twisted my ankle. Uh, but as it turns out, it was more than just a sprained ankle. It was an actually clean break uh, on the bottom of my left foot. And that was the end of the basketball career for me. And fortunately, they let me keep my basketball scholarship. And I started doing some things with the athletic department mm -hmm. and decided that, you know, I need to really focus on getting out of here and go and starting whatever route might be for my right. career. Uh, but, man, what a tremendous experience it was for me to be there at Park College at that time, Park University now. It was a melting pot of students yes, from they have, all over the world. It, the place is incredible if you really look at the history of Park it was Park College, now it's Park University. They have people from first time, everywhere. First time I'd ever met someone from Micronesia. <laughs> I didn't even know that Micronesia existed. <laughs> and there were Micronesians on campus, and people were from Saudi Arabia, from Africa. I mean, any and everywhere. It was just a beautiful experience to be around so many different ethnicities and yeah. nationalities. And it really, I think, made my college experience a very well-rounded experience. So you were in, in there. You are in communications. I know you yeah. wanted to do radio and TV, didn't you? Yeah, no, didn't you I wanted? thought it was. I thought it was. <laughs> and I, I studied communications art with an emphasis in broadcast communication and, and journalism. Right. And when I got out, you know, it's like anybody else. You're just trying to find a job. Yeah, absolutely. Trying to find a job. You hear her mom in your ear. <laughs> <clears throat> and my first job was with the Kansas City Star. Right. And so 
it, it's so funny because you, I guess I've earned this reputation of being this snazzy dresser that it's hard for people to believe that when I started working at the Kansas City Star in the composing room, I used to wear a denim apron. I was walking around with a denim apron, a pica pole, and an exacto knife, uh, cutting and pasting print wow. for the for the newspaper. That's right. And got an inside look at how the paper was put together. And then about a year later, I moved over to the composing. Uh, I'm sorry, over to the promotions department, and. and Everything started to kind of change for me at that point. Right. You started to sort of switch your ideas of yeah. what you wanted to do, where, yeah. where'd you want to go. Yeah. And where was that dream of, okay, I got to get out of the star here eventually and get on my own. Where was that dream before you got bit by the buck bug? Yeah. You know, it was really interesting because I didn't see myself in that promotions environment. I was either going to try and do radio, TV, or write. And I guess the marketing side just kind of happened by happenstance. Mm -hmm. And this opportunity came about, and I went over to work in the promotions group. We used to work out of the Topsy building, right oh, across the gosh, street from yes, the stock. that's right. Yeah, right across the street from the main building. And, and that is, I got an opportunity to do some really creative things, work with some amazingly talented artists and writers, and we were putting together these very cool award-winning campaigns and this kind of stuff. And that was a side that I didn't even realize that was there, and it became really intriguing and interesting to me, and I got I really got into it. And the next thing I know, I after 10 years there at the newspaper, I left to go to Kaiser Permanente. Oh, gosh, Kaiser yes. Permanente, working Absolutely. with my good friend Gerard Grimaldi wow. over at Kaiser in, in the Community Relations Department. Uh -huh. which, uh, and... I was there for three years before I took a leap of faith and became the museum's first director of marketing in 1998. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So you worked at Kaiser Permi uh, Permanente for how long? Three years. Three years, okay. Three years. So then, I was on that side of over. giving money. Now I'm on <laughs> that side right. of asking for money. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a whole new world yeah, there, no, no, the, the giving was a whole lot more. Now I, wow. I take that back. I don't know if it was easier because you only had a limited budget. And you had to make some tough decisions about who you gave money. So I, it helps me understand right. how the folks who are making these decisions on who gets money when they decide to give right. money because they, they don't have unlimited budgets. And all of these not-for-profit organizations are tremendously valuable to, right. our, to our great city. And they have to make some tough decisions. And so, you know, you know, you have to get in there. You have to really build your case for support. Yeah, and I think the way the museum – is going now in a way, you know, Buck set up and then you coming along after him. I think they realize that as well. I mean, they know when they got a good thing. They don't want to lose it to Pittsburgh. Okay, <laughs> we'll just put it to that one. Okay? We ain't giving nothing to Pittsburgh. <laughs> We're not giving nothing back to those guys. But they already knew you at the Negro Leagues Baseball they Museum did. because of all your volunteer work yeah, that you did yeah. there for and a I had served on the board. Yeah. I had served on the board for about five years. Sure. And so I was a volunteer role there on the board, and then I stepped off the board to become the museum's first Director of Marketing. Right. And that was in 1998. And I was involved from 1998 through 2010 when I left briefly. 2010, I was Vice President of Marketing, left briefly to go take on another role as the Executive Director of the National Sports Center for the Disabled that had a Kansas City office out of Parks and Rec. And 13 months later, though, man, I was coming back home. Yeah, well. Being introduced yeah. as President of the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. I'll bet when you walked out of that and then you turn around and went, oh, doggone, what did I do that for? You, you know, know, and then it, turn, it was even so, though you had a good year. It was so interesting that when I left and they threw this big going away party and gave me all these nice parting gifts and there were a couple of people who came over to me and said, you'll be back. Mm -hmm. And I was like... No, man, you know, this is it. I've had a great run sure. here at the museum. Of course, by that time, Buck had already passed yes, away. Mm -hmm. The museum had transitioned, and there was new leadership in place. Right. It wasn't the same place that I had, you know, known and loved from a leadership standpoint. The institution was still the same. But I'm saying, okay, I, that chapter is done. I'm moving on, and I'm starting a new chapter now. And they kept saying, oh, you'll be back. Mm -hmm. And yep. they were right. <laughs> they were right. 13 yes. months later, I, here I was right. coming back, and I'm saying to myself, 
Now, I might have to give these gifts back. Well, of course, the golf ball, the people who gave me golf balls, I had lost them already. So, yeah, yeah they, <laughs> they're all gone. And, and, and of all you folks out here who know Bob Kendrick, okay, I, like I said, I thought I was going to wear a, a tuxedo in here today because I had no idea. So Bob comes in off the golf course. <laughs> Wouldn't you know it? He comes in off the golf course. Yeah, and all those golf balls are lost. Yeah, wherever, wherever you were, wherever you're doing it. And, and Buck had taken you under his wing anyway, yeah. right? You had he had an affinity for you, and right away you knew that there was just something special about this guy, and just you were learning. He was a tremendous mentor for you. Yeah, you know, and I don't. Sometimes I ask myself, why me? Because this could have been anyone. And, and why me? And they paid me, Frank, to hang out with Buckle Hill, wow. if you could imagine. Mm-hmm. And the fact that we traveled the country together. There were all these car rides and plane rides and breakfast and lunch and dinner and golf. You know, he was an, uh, he oh, was an avid, avid golfer. golfer yeah. He was a really good golfer. Shot 75 at age 75, shot 94 at age 94. And and that night after we played that round at Wolf Creek, and we're sitting at dinner, and he looks at me, and and Dave Kindred, the great writer, Mm -hmm. uh, was there with me, and and George Hobbs, uh, who had set up this round of golf. We're all at dinner. He just says, well, fellas, I shoot my age but that ain't a good score anymore. <laughs> Say, Buck, there are some days I take 94 now. Oh, but 94 at 94, I'll sign up for that right now. But, man, what a blessing it was for me to be there with him, to witness how people reacted to this man. You knew you were in the presence of someone special. Right. And, and this was different because it wasn't a standoffish kind of special. This was a inviting, engaging kind of special. If he didn't know you, he wanted to know you. Mm-hmm. And, and people seemingly responded to that. I mean, no matter where we went, if we were in the airport, he'd walk over to you, introduce himself. My name is Buck O'Neill. What's yours? By the time we were leaving to go to our respective gates, they were sharing an embrace as if they'd known each other all their lives. And, and I'm witnessing this uh, and, and I knew it was special. And after he passed away, when he passed away, people would call or write me and thank me. And I have nothing to do with it. But they would thank me or they wanted to share how those moments were life-altering, those encounters that they had with Buck O'Neill. There was a certain innateness about this man. You know, and I liken it to Gandhi, Mother Teresa, Mandela, I was just Dr. Say, King. Yes. Yeah, who, they seemingly had the ability to see the good in everybody. Sometimes, Frank, even when they weren't good, Buck saw the good in them. <laughs> yeah. You know, but that's the way that he was. In there. Yeah, it's and in he there. Knew that. And he, he knew, knew that. And he knew it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and the other thing for you then, when did you realize he was sort of mentoring? Did he ever say to you, hey, look, I want you to take over what I do? I Maybe whatever capacity, but I, w- I would like you to take over what I do and over continue his, this. Over his final days, uh-huh. he wanted me to know that he felt like the museum would be in good hands if I were to become his leader. Right. And that meant the world to me, oh, that he had that kind of faith in me. And that's something that I'll always cherish. Now, it didn't work out the way that Buck wanted it initially, but ultimately it it did. It has. Have you ever, has anybody ever come to you and said, hey, uh, you know, Bob, uh, we have this organization we'd like you to lead. Have you ever been, uh, you know, courted by, I'm sure you've been courted by other people. You get those calls from headhunters and other places Mm -hmm. that reach out to you and would love for you to come in and do it. I do think, though, that a lot of people, because they've connected me so greatly with this museum, feel a little guilty if they were to come in and try and and pull me away from the organization. But, man, I just so enjoy the work that I do, the people that I do this work with. At this stage in the ballgame now, now this is what I want to do. Yeah. And, And we've got some very ambitious plans that I would love to see them through before I eventually hang it up. But yeah. now I've had a tremendous ride with this institution. I tell people all the time, the museum has given me far more 
than I can ever give in. Again, this is a kid from Crawfordville, Georgia, <laughs> man, that has had the opportunity to walk through that museum with American presidents and first ladies of these United States, the late, great General Colin Powell, and, of course, my all-time favorite baseball player, my childhood idol, Henry Aaron, mm -hmm. uh, who is the only person that I've ever been starstruck by. And that's with American presidents and first ladies and all these other dignitaries and athletes that have walked through that museum. They're all amazing individuals, but with no disrespect to any of them. Right. They are not Henry Aaron in the eyes, mind, and heart of this kid from Crawfordville, Georgia. And Frank, to walk through that museum with Henry Aaron was surreal for me. I was nervous as all could get up. I mean, just nervous. I'm at home, and this is 1999. And Major League Baseball was celebrating the 25th anniversary of Mr. Aaron's breaking of Ruth's record. Mm -hmm. it took 25 years before he could finally exhale and enjoy what many thought to be the most prestigious accomplishment in sports ever. Right. Because of all the hate he was and hated vitriol, for that. oh, yes, absolutely, absolutely, that he received death threats, everything, uh, else, everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so Buck was out of town, and the Royals had arranged for Mr. Aaron to be one of the stops here in Kansas City. They set it up for him to come to the museum. Buck's out of town, so guess who gets to take his wow. childhood idol on the tour? <laughs> you guessed it, old Bob. And I'm at home, man. I'm laying the stuff out. My wife is like, "What is wrong with you?" I'm like, "Look, you don't understand." <laughs> <laughs> it's Henry Aaron. So we get to the museum. They get me mic'd up. There's a throng of media that's following us. Mr. Aaron and his wife, Billy, accompanying me as we go through the museum. And it was so amazing to share stuff about the Negro Leagues that he didn't know about, even though he was a part of the Negro Leagues. Mm -hmm. He was just there, though, for such a short period of time. And we get to one area in the exhibit, and my favorite photograph in the entire exhibition is a photograph of an 18-year-old Henry Aaron standing at the train station in Mobile, Alabama, 1952. He is real thin. He couldn't have weighed more than 160 pounds soaking wet. He looked very frail and very afraid. He was about to leave home, likely for the first time, to go join the Indianapolis Clowns mm -hmm. of the Negro Leagues. Right. And at that time, Mr. Aaron was a skinny, cross-handed, hitting shortstop. So for those of you who may be hearing that term for the first time, he was a right-hand hitter who was hitting with his left hand on top. On top of the bat. Uh-huh. That's unorthodox. The fear is that you break your you wrist. You break your wrist exactly. if you're trying to do that. Hitting in that manner. <laughs> Henry Aaron is knocking the cover off the baseball in a highly unorthodox fashion. He gets to the clouds. They put the right hand on top. And the rest, as they say, is history. history. <laughs> yeah, he was shortly after discovered by the Boston Braves, who, of course, would become the Milwaukee Braves, who would become the Atlanta Braves. And, of course, Mr. Aaron will go down in this sport as one of his all-time greatest players. But it all began in the Negro Leagues, yeah. 1952, Mobile, Alabama. And the photograph is classic. There's a small cardboard duffel bag right by his foot. That's all he had. And he had seen the photo, but it had been a long time since he had seen it. And he looks at me and says, Bob, I may have had two changes of clothes in that bag, a dollar fifty cents in my pocket, wow. and a ham sandwich my mama had made me going to go chase that dream. It worked out pretty well for the hammer. Wow. Gosh, that is a great story. There are so many wonderful stories for all you people who have never been there, especially you Kansas Cityans who love this city so much like we do. Um, you've got to go to Negro Lakes Baseball Museum. And, Bob, for you, what is it about this town? You know, you, you're from the South, Crawfordsville, Georgia, and you come up here for park, and you basically you, you never left. I never left. I've so, lived here longer than I did in Georgia now. Oh, exactly, yeah. And I think Buck summarized it best. Buck said when he came to join the Kansas City Monarchs in 1938, he says, I knew I was coming to the heart of America. I never knew I was coming to the center of the universe. And 18th and Vine was the center of the universe, and this city just grows on you, man. There are great people in this city. And to me, a great city is not measured by the stuff it has. 
It's measured by the people. people. The people that make is that what makes it the great city. Now we've got great stuff. We've got everything that you need, I think, to attract folks to our wonderful city. It's not overwhelmingly large like New York, L.A. It's cosmopolitan enough, but you don't feel the congestion. You know, you've got quality people. I look at people, you walk past people, they open their mouths and speak. You know, Buck and I would go to New York. It was funny. They got, I'm sure they probably knew we were two country bumpkins. And we walked into New York. I don't know how many people in New York, 16, 17 million people in New York. <laughs> Too many. Buck and I would try to speak to all of them. <laughs> <laughs> Surprised you're not still there. <laughs> and they look at us, and they're looking at us like, okay, what's wrong with you all? That's right. But, man, I can't get on the elevator, look you dead in your face, and not say good morning, a good afternoon, a good evening. Just can't do it. Here in Kansas City, it's almost the norm. If you look at somebody, you acknowledge their presence. And, and part of that for me was growing up in the South as well. And so, but no, this city, man, uh, this city has been special to me and to my family. And I'm so proud to call Kansas City home. Yeah. And we're so proud to have you here. Now, one last question for you. Yes, sir. Okay. Who are you grooming to take your spot sometime down the road? Or at least you have a pretty good idea somewhere down the road. Yeah, no, no. All good things must come to an they end. They certainly do. Yeah, they do. And, and and we know this. Father time is undefeated. Yes, he now, is. Now, we can run from it, and I'm running. <laughs> I'm ducking and dodging. No, no, no. You, you're walking fast. You said you never yeah, run. Yeah, no, no. Okay, yeah, you're just walking real fast. But, you know, that is something that we know has to happen. Well, from my perspective, a transition plan mm -hmm. must be part of what I do. And the opportunity to bring in new talent into our organization, that's one thing that will the new museum will give us an opportunity. We're so landlocked where we are now that we don't have room to bring in this talent. Right. And I'm sure there are a lot of folks out there who would jump at the opportunity to be part of a growing, thriving museum that hopefully will fall right into place and kind of follow in my footsteps, so to speak. You know, I followed in Buck's footsteps. Right. Those are some enormous footprints, man. You can't exactly. feel them. You know, you'd be naive to think that you could feel those big shoes. But for me, it's an honor to walk in his footsteps. It really is. It's an honor to walk in his footsteps. And for a lot of people, his shadow would loom so large mm -hmm. that they would crumble under the weight of his shadow. I don't look at it that way. For me, Frank, his shadow protects me. Yeah, he's guiding my footsteps. And I want to be that same to someone else. Because what I do want to do is I want to make sure that this museum is healthy and strong. And whomever comes in after me will have a 40, 50 yard head start in comparison. Right. You know, as we run this 100 yard dash, uh, 110 meter, whatever it is these days. <laughs> that they run now in terms of being able to continue to grow and build upon what we have. And so that's kind of what I've dedicated myself to now as we look ambitiously to build this new museum and set up this museum for long-term sustainable growth and then bringing in the right group of talent to help lead it and hopefully have someone that I will recommend. Right. Now, my board may feel differently sure. by the time it's all said and done, but it is my job to make sure that there's someone who I would very at least recommend they step into that role, yeah. and hopefully they will be prepared. And, and I hope these stories that I have been very fortunate to have learned from Buck and others, that they won't abandon those stories, that those stories will live forever. I think that will be part of the resume. <laughs> you got to tell those stories. You can't ever let that die. You can't ever let that dream die. And whoever follows you is going to be following some big footsteps too, my friend. Well, man, I so appreciate that. In your show, you know, God bless you. We love you. You know that. We love you. We love you're here. We love this city like you do, and uh, that, that's all important. Thanks, buddy. Hey, it's always a pleasure, hey, Frank. Thanks go, so much for having me. Go shoot your age, will you? Yeah, yeah. Oh, the great Bob Kendrick. <laughs>